on various diseases. These are European data, and uh, knowing that you have 1.4 billion Indians, you even have more of those here in your country. And um, we will hear later when Rinopoletti the cryobiopsy. We have recommendations for cryobiopsy even coming out of India. What is the next step is the launch of the small, slim cryoprobe 1.1 millimeter. So you really can use it through the, the working channel of a slim ebuscope, but, and that is new, you also can use it through the working channel of an ebuscope. So this is mediastinal cryobiopsy, uh, something which is new. We have the publications out nowadays uh, that you really can use your ebuscope as a guidance for the cryoprobe, for the slim cryoprobe, also for the mediastinum. And therefore, you can establish a diagnostic also in patients which have maybe a lymphoma or other non-lung cancer medicinal diseases. We will have, we have OCT. OCT is used more or less as optical coherence tomography in the central airways. There is a lot of research ongoing to using that to have a better understanding which patient is maybe a candidate for a tumor plus T, an asthma therapy. But we also having there now slimmer probes and with the slimmer OCT probes, you can move the probes forward in the alveolar space. You see the filling of the alveolar space. This is a patient suffering on an, um, on an exogen allergic um, alveolitis. And maybe we are able to realize earlier with the help of the scope is the if the patient is responding to one of the drugs you are using in the various options of interstitial lung disease. Those techniques are nowadays available. available. The techniques are under evaluation. If you really get an additional information when you use the smaller CT probes in the peripheral part. And what we also start doing, we start staining the airways because what we're doing with our scope, we're normally going for structural analysis. You look and based on the experience, you can say the mucosa is abnormal or the mucosa is normal, but when you combine your visual information with metabolic information you get at the same procedure, we may be getting more precisely to detect what is abnormal in the endobronchial system and maybe we are able to take the biopsies really from the spot we want to have the material from. The other big, big business are the small nodules. The, we have more and more use of CAT scans for various reasons and offering people with a specific age and specific risk factors. A CAT scan means that you detect small lesions and we have to detect and diagnose those small lesions. This is what we did the last 60 years doing a fluoroscopy and doing a transbronchial lung biopsy, but it was published even in 1967 that by smaller lesions, your yield is dropping down. So therefore, we have to deal with that small pulmonary nodule challenge because we know they are all in the peripheral part. Uh, at least you are blind, you need some navigation support that the diameters are small. So this is a complex issue, therefore we have navigational bronchoscopy in the mean established and you see this is the timeline. We started with the classical transbronchial biopsy, we have had then the EBUS, we, we got the navigation support, electromagnetic, without electromagnetic, and nowadays we are in the age of uh, robotic assist bronchoscopy. Kylie will talk about that a little bit later. So there was a quick uh, rapid development, and these are the two techniques which are mostly used when you talk about robotic assist bronchoscopy. But both of those systems, all, there's also a third system available in the US, they only have um, one arm. And um, what we're always doing when we want to work on small nodules, we're competing with the surgeons. 
So we have to update those techniques. And one of the techniques I think you have to have is the cone beam CT. Uh, I've seen a lot of interventions in the scope, from the scope side, but I think that imaging um, assist you have when you get that cone beam CT during your procedure where you really get the information if your probe or your ablation uh, catheter is really there where you want to have it. This is for me one of the next step, steps which moving in the room that you get your three-dimensional information. And as mentioned, uh, oh, this was too quick, the robotic systems, they have one arm, but they are the first prototypes of robotic systems which have two little arms. So you have one arm who is doing the work ablating, biopsy, or whatever. And the other arm has the optical tools embedded that you can confirm what you are doing. So I think especially when you think about ablation of lesion, it makes a lot of sense that you have techniques directly at the point of interest and you can follow what happens when you ablate or when you use the microwave ablation. And this is what we are working on. We're working on technologies to ablate those little lesions. And uh, Kelvin will give you also later, therefore, an update. Uh, there is radio frequency ablation available since 2016. A lot of work is coming out of China for that technology. There are the microwaves available even, therefore, um, the techniques are out and you also have the same workflow. You need a navigation system which brings you to the spot. You mostly confirm then the positioning with the EBUS. You do a cone beam CT and then you do the ablation. At the moment, everything is focused in the direction that it might be that microwaves are the better technology, but there are some, a lot of things ongoing. Um, one of the techniques which is at the moment in the animal phase are the cryoprobes, so not longer only for, di for diagnostic purposes, but also for ablation might be cooling, uh, a very interesting technology. And when, uh, when you look especially to an effect which is at the moment not really completely understood, the abscopal effect. It seems that the stimulation of the immune system is maybe max when you use the cryoablation. And the other big, big field where we're seeing rapid development is the field of the obstructive lung disease. Uh, it started with endoscopic lung rheum reduction in 2002 when to the tumor uh, and Palav Shah placed the first valves in the Royal Brompton. Um, the idea of all those technologies is to make the hyperinflated lung smaller, and by reducing the size of the lung, you improve the breathing mechanics, you improve the exercise capacity, and re reduce the mortality. Actually, we have three techniques, therefore, on the market. We have the valves, we have the coils, and we have the vapor. Um, I think vapor and valves are also available here in India. Um, all those technologies has pros and cons, and the patient group, which should be treated, which the single technologies are well described. So what is ongoing there? We will getting a new valve company, uh, this new valve, this is a valve which is covering a whole lobe. So this is one bigger device which can cover the whole lower lobe, for example, in that image. So the valve second generations are coming. We have to do uh, the trial work to see how good they are working. We have even the coils, the second generation. This is a Chinese product. Um, the first in human trials were done in Europe. Now the, tri the randomized control trials are ongoing in China. But we also have a third generation of the coils. Uh, therefore, we just finished the first in human work. Now even therefore, we're designing the randomized control trials for that coil. So there are updated versions of the technologies we have in our hand already in the first 
phases of the trial, so that means there might be um, new versions available and hopefully then the price will come down for the different technologies. And even the vapor is there, and for the vapor we're designing at the moment a trial how we can use that also in the lower law. And there's also some completely new ideas um, on the way when you go back, what is emphysema? Then we're knowing that emphysema is a small airway disease and why not stenting the peripheral part of the lungs? So this is one of the trials which are at the moment ongoing. The first in human trials to do peripheral stenting to reopen the peripheral part of the lungs by putting small stents in. We have to see how the ways are going, but uh, two different techniques are available for that as well. Chronic bronchitis, I think Palaf will focus more tomorrow more on that uh, spot. We have the areoplasty with quite uh, good data. The randomized control trial is running at the moment. But even here, we have two other technologies already um, upcoming, so the spray cryo, even most work is coming from PADAF in that. Yes, at the moment, PADAF knows that better in one, I think, phase two and a half trial, something like that. But there is also a next technology coming, focusing on the same target, so reducing the glands by a different um, heating technology so for chronic bronchitis, I'm relatively sure that we will have at the end of the year three technologies available and then we have to decide which technology works best. And the same is happening for the targeted lung denervation. Targeted lung denervation is a technology which focuses on the vagus nerve to destroy the vagus nerve and having a permanent um, stop of the bronchoconstriction signal. Targeted lung denervation is the technology we're using at the moment, also in, an, in the pivotal trial, in the Airflow 3 trial, but even for the uh, targeted lung denervation, there is uh, the version 2 and 3 already in the first human trials. Um, for all of you who, who have done a couple of targeted lung denervation procedures, it's sometimes tricky. You have to rotate the catheter, but there are catheters now available where you don't have to do that four times rotation. And also in the animal trial, there's another technology having a completely different uh, background who is shown in the animal work that even with that technology, you can destroy the nerve signal, so even for targeted lung denervation for technology, it might be possible that we have not only one company on the market who gives us solution for that. So summarizing my talk, I hope I was able to show you based on pictures, because we have to create the everything for everything I showed you based on pictures, what is coming in 2023, and maybe then we can decide in 2024 what really made it at the end to the market. But I'm relatively sure, as uh, the previous speaker showed you, especially the data from the US, more and more people have interest in interventional pulmonology. That really gives you the signal that even for the companies, interventional pulmonology is a super interesting market because we have many, many patients and I'm relatively sure we can give a lot of patients better hope when we use our endoscope and therefore I thank you for your attention.